What's up, everybody? Happy Friday. We don't do a ton of these on Friday. Um, so it's kind of nice to get to hang out before the weekend starts for my kids. Next week is the last week of school. Uh, we've got some uh, vacations planned, some staycation type of stuff, some conferences. So we'll talk about our channel's summer plans and what you all have planned as well. Um, we also have our members only live next week. That's going to be really fun and really different than any we have done before. So check that out and join if you haven't already. We've also got some changes coming to the membership, some new things we're going to add, some new um, uh, kind of interactions we can have, some of which requested by you all. And speaking of requests, this case Corey Richens, I believe that's how you say it, but as we always get introduced to state to new cases, there are names and counties and cities and things that we'll learn pronunciation together. So that's how I'm calling it right now, Corey Richards. I don't know if it's Corey or Cowrie, but I'm, I'm assuming it's Corey. And this is yet another unbelievable story. Before I was into looking at cases in other states and other jurisdictions that were just interesting to the general public, I knew that it's a wild world and it can be dark and it's a broken world with people that do unimaginable things. But since I've started doing YouTube and breaking down these cases and talking about the legal aspects and what can be proven and what can't, my mind is continuously blown about what people are potentially capable of. Because I knew nothing about this case coming into it. And then when I was first introduced to it, the kind of headline was, Lady Wright's book, children's book, to try to help people cope with death after the sudden death of her 39-year-old husband. And now she's charged criminally with her involvement in that death. For someone to be that unabashed, to write a book and go on a press tour is unbelievable to me. And then details come out about mansions and parties and poisoning and theft and prior attempts at poisoning. So it's really a wild one. Um, but you all were interested, had questions, so we're going to talk about it today. little intro, little tester to see if it's something you guys actually want to talk about. If I can add any value to talking about this case, um, then we can talk about it. I don't just need to repeat details or, you know, we're going to watch a couple clips from other shows and other news stations or YouTube channels that have like summaries of the case to give us kind of a snapshot of what the facts are, what the allegations are. And then we'll talk about the charges. We'll talk about what can be proven, admissions that have been made, how you'd prove this case if you were a prosecutor, how you'd defend it potentially, because we do have her arrest warrant, um, which has some of the facts in it and the, I think, five crimes she's charged with. So we are going to talk about all of that. Um, but I think to start, just a little short news clip that gives us some of the background and a little summary um, for us to discuss the case together. Again, like I said, I have to hit that like button if you're interested in this topic. That lets me know. The more likes we get, the more interest we have. Um, and subscribe if you want us to keep checking this case out and following it along with it because our subscribers are the ones that pick our content. Um, and they are the ones that came up with this content and why we are talking about this case. Um, let's see. I mean, just look at this title. Utah mom partied at new mansion days after her husband's death. That's the title. So let's take a listen together. Or about what police think may have prompted a woman who wrote a children's book about grieving to have allegedly killed her husband. It led to that grief. This is 33-year-old Corey Richards sitting down with a local lifestyle show Good Things Utah just last month to promote her book about how she and her children are dealing with the loss of her husband. She billed it as a support book for other families. So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. It completely 
took us all by shock. Um, and we have three little boys, 10, 9, and 6. Plot twist. Rich- That's part of her media tour when she wrote a book, as I said, to talk about grieving. Within a year, the book was done and published and out. Um, and again, what does this mean for the case? What does this mean legally, right? Because this is absolutely going to be part of it. This is absolutely going to be something that is a part of this case. As we've seen just with two of our more recent cases, Lori Vallow and Alec Murdoch, the generally bad gal rule is going to come down upon her. If there are facts that prove that she did it, even if it's not to the level of beyond a reasonable doubt, the jury will start to look at her actions post-death and say, how could you have possibly done this? And if the arrow starts pointing in the direction of her guilt, they will hate her. And we heard from the juror in Lori Vallow's case, that is the face of pure evil. How could a mother do this? What a big deal it was that she was sitting poolside in Hawaii with her new husband while her children were stuffed in the backyard. These are the types of things that jurors just cannot reconcile during a criminal case. And I get it. I understand. Kitchens arrested a month later on charges that she's the one who killed him by poison, by the way, with fentanyl laced a Moscow mule cocktail. But now new court records reveal Richens and her husband, Eric, were arguing over a $2 million real estate deal in the months before police say Eric was murdered. Corey Richens, they allege, wanted to purchase this 20,000 square foot, eight bedroom, 12 bath. What do you do with 12 baths? Unfinished mansion in Heber City, Utah, as part of her real estate and home flipping business. Court documents and Eric's own family say he thought the home was too expensive and wouldn't give her the money. But just a day after Eric's death, Richens closed on the mansion and allegedly hosted a party there to celebrate. Trace. So this is a little this is a little weird to me. And I see people in the chat already saying the same thing. Um, she bought a house that he didn't want to buy. Okay, so there's a lot coming, a lot coming in this video that I think is very bad for Corey Richens. But there's also some things that that make me uh, feel a little uneasy. And this is one. And again, it's okay if we disagree. I love starting with that because I know a lot of people are going to disagree. I know people are ready to condemn her. It is not looking good for her with a lot of the evidence we're about to get to. But this specific one to me is a little strange because as I hear more details, I hear things like court documents stated. What court documents? Because if it's just people's statements in court documents, are those really court documents or are those just statements? Or did he put something in the real estate transaction that shows he didn't want it? Or is there an email or something like that? But family members saying he didn't want it or thought it was too expensive. Okay, that's one thing. It's it's interesting because how many people, like how many of you guys have seen Utah and you know those those states where they have these influencer moms that buy these houses and they're beautiful, nice big houses. I've seen it, you know, laughed about it before with my wife and other people that follow a bunch of these people because they have, you know, great style and decor and whatever, or even um like love it or listed or those like house flipping. It's like, you know, Jared makes shoelaces for a living and his wife, Ashley, uh, types out children's books and their budget for their house is $50 million. And they're looking at this 12 bedroom house, whatever it may be, you know, stuff like that. You hear about it. But to me, the most interesting thing about this being a big piece of evidence that she wanted this house and he didn't is that she closed on it the day after his death. And at first, you would think that, wow, she had to get rid of him to get this house because he didn't want this house. For anybody that's bought a house, okay, and if you if you're in the chat and you have bought a house, the making shoelaces was a joke. That that's that nothing to do with what this these people did. Um, that was a joke. Um, but if anybody's bought a house. You can't not want to buy it and say you're not going to buy it and not agree if you're a partnership, a marriage, whatever, sharing this. You can't just close on it the next day. 
So that's one thing that that is a little confusing is if he really didn't want to buy this house and it was over this house and, you know, he wouldn't let her buy this house or give her the money or whatever their relationship was with that. So she gets rid of him and then she closes on the house a day later. I, that doesn't line up to me. That does not line up to me. Um, Closing is usually a miserable process that takes at least 30 days and a lot goes into it. You have to provide a lot of documentation, proof of funds, all sorts of stuff. You usually have to pay money before you can close and sign the dotted line. So to me, I just don't see that as a legitimate. Now, again, if there's emails where he's saying, no, we're calling it off, and then the next day he's dead, and then the next day she signs for it, okay. But that's only with this piece of evidence, okay? And stick with me because there is a lot more that is much more difficult, and I hazard to guess impossible for her to explain away. So we will get there. But that was just, I'm just taking each piece of evidence one by one, and that's just the first one. It's some suspicions from law enforcement. Now the Salt Lake City Tribune citing a probate court petition reports that Corey Richens was actually stealing from her husband. He came from a well-known, well-connected family in Utah as far as back as three years into their marriage. Quote, by at least 2016, she was stealing money from him in order to afford to flip houses and address her ongoing financial woes. The petition alleges she began taking money from his bank accounts as well as running up debts on credit cards in his name without his knowledge. And that in 2020, Eric Richens learned. So I don't, again, I don't want to be insensitive to any of this. But if you're married in 2016 and your wife is taking money out of your bank accounts and using your credit cards without your knowledge and you stay married to your wife and you work it out, whatever, it could be categorized as stealing. It could also be categorized as one person in a partnership or a marriage doing something that the other person doesn't like them doing, fighting about it, and then getting through it, right? So again, this stuff may come in, may not come in. Sometimes stuff like this does come in. But again, there's more. I just think that there's some some reaching in some of these things. Like, you know, your wife is stealing um, from you by using a credit card without telling you. I don't know. That's That's a little bit much. But again, it gets worse. Corey Richens had taken at least $100,000 from his accounts as well as borrowed large amounts of money on his credit card in excess of $30,000. Also in 2020, Eric discovered that Corey had borrowed $250,000 using a fraudulent power of attorney, forging his initials on documents. That's not good. It's getting worse, like I said. Fraudulent powers of attorney using things like that, that's bad. And that's definitely going to come in that she was already stealing money because as we know, money is the best motive a prosecutor can have in a case like this. We saw it as a motive in Lori Vallow's case. We saw it as a motive in Alec Murdoch's case. And it will absolutely be a motive here. More on that later. When Eric confronted her, Corey admitted to taking the money. There were other red flags. In January of last year, authorities alleged Corey Richens tried to make herself the sole beneficiary on a life insurance policy held by her husband and his business partner. She's also accused of taking upwards of 130 grand earmarked by Eric to pay his taxes. Following her arrest, Richen's book, Are You With Me?, dedicated to her, quote, amazing husband and a wonderful father, has been removed from Amazon. His family says Eric Richens was convinced his wife had tried poisoning him several times before he stayed in the relationship for the sake of the three sons. So that was a big thing right there. He is convinced and other people are convinced and more, more is coming out about this as well that she had tried to poison him in the past. So is that going to come in? Is that going to be something that matters in this case? Again, we can look back at other cases, other bad acts, especially similar bad acts that show an MO, a modus operandi, the way you do business as a criminal, meaning you try to poison people. If you have those other bad acts in your past, especially with the same victim, that's going to come in. And you only have to prove those other bad acts by clear and convincing evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt. So that is a much lower bar. I hear people asking, how did she get caught? We're getting there. Was gearing up to file for divorce when he was found dead at the foot of their bed. The gearing up for filing for divorce. I mean, it's like either you file for divorce or you don't, you know, talking about it. Okay. That's one thing she stole from him. She tried to poison him. He hadn't divorced her then. There's a lot of, Seriously heavy facts against her. That one, we'll see.
last March. Joining me now, Jesse Weber, attorney and host on the Law and Crime Network. He's also a News Nation legal contributor. He's been following the case closely. Sounds like they think this is all about the money. I mean, you laid it out. One of the things I'll add is right before he died, he was going to reveal to her that she was cut out of the will. You know, it was interesting that he had his sister as the trustee of all of his property. He wanted to leave it all under her control without Corey knowing that. And, and I think that's pretty significant because you have this history where she was allegedly stealing from him, forging his identity, stealing from him in different ways. And, and it's really interesting about the life insurance policy as well because she had switched it to her to be the beneficiary. He was alerted and without her knowing, switched it back to his <laughs> sister. So it seems like- So now again, we're getting into the more damning evidence. She's removed from the will. Reminds you of the Lori Vallow case. She's switching herself as the beneficiary on health insurance. Reminds you of some other cases we've talked about. I've actually had some cases of my own. When that happens, that's a bad thing, and that shows motive. There's other evidence that she opened up additional life insurance policies over the last few years on her husband. Bad. Money as the motive. This is about as good of a motive, as solid of a motive as I've ever heard on a factional, factual scenario this early in a case, that they have this many dominoes showing that this was all about the money and she was going to lose the money and she was losing the money. I've also read there was a prenup and that he was pulling her off certain things. Time was running out for her. Like the money and all with the house because it was only the day after that she sells the house. She closes on it and throws this big party. I want to play a little more of this interview that she did when she was promoting her book right? Her book about grieving because her husband had died, how she and her kids were dealing with this. Um, this is uh, her being asked about the timing of writing the book so quickly. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I mean, she's right. And that's so sad. And think about that. That's a real part of this case is her kids and dealing with the grief. They're really dealing with the grief. And she has the, the gall to go on this press tour and this book tour and do this. I mean, this is going to be horrible. And like we've said in the past, nothing sinks a person than more than their own words. And these are not the only statements she's made. We're going to talk about some statements to law enforcement that are also going to absolutely be used against her. But this, I mean, this is horrible. If she didn't do it, if she didn't, right? Because you are innocent until proven guilty in this country. If she didn't do it, this still looks horrible. So quickly going after, writing the book this quickly, going on the press tour talking about it, the parties, you know, mixed in with the parties and the mansions and stuff right after. It just is not a look good look regardless of what happened. I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night and I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. Maybe because the facts are sort of unique in this book, in this story. So she couldn't find a book that actually fit the facts. I just got to say, I think it's pretty incredible that she's accused of killing him for money and yet she exploits his death for fourteen ninety nine right. on Amazon. I mean, right. it's just, I think that's pretty incredible. Thank you for watching. Yeah, pretty good point. Pretty good point. All right. So we have another clip to watch, but before we get there, I'm going to answer some questions and then we're going to read the arrest um, warrant, which has more details and official details. Mary, order your rainbow sherbet t-shirt. Can't wait to get it. It is probably my favorite piece of merch that I have. Uh, TP, uh, you become a member in the, there's a join button right under the video. Amanda just finished watching you on Annalise's channel. Is it, and it's Annie Elise, right? I always want to say Annalise. I hear Annalise, but Annie Elise, 
Um, I love it when my favorite streamers collab. Yeah, she's really cool. And I think that I'm going to end up doing more with her in the future. She has a way of engaging with people that people just love the way she talks about this stuff. Uh, Mary Angel, Mary Angel Rincon, uh, lawyer, you know.com. That's where the merch is lawyer, you know.com. And Jacques blue we got some new members joining, which is always fun. Sandy D Sandra D. Uh, I wish more people respected themselves enough to respect their significant others more. Just respect anybody else more respect other people more than they uh, respect and care about themselves, right? So much of it just comes down to selfishness in all these cases. I mean, for people to be more selfish than people they don't know, it's like, that's more, that's like generally acceptable. I disagree with it, but generally acceptable. But then when you talk about, you know, your family members, it gets less accept acceptable with your friends. But then when you talk about your kids, it's like nobody understands that. And your spouse, it's like, what is happening? Crazy Cat Queen. I've purchased or sold four houses in the past. Fastest closing I've ever had was 10 days because cash. Yeah, I've bought stuff cash too. And you can say like close in three days, but you never actually close in three days. Melanie, she had his safe drilled open to take 200K in cash. That was in the safe. I hear you. And I don't want to normalize, you know, problems in marriages or whatever, but lots of marriages have money issues where one spouse is a spender, the other one's a saver. Um, so, so I get it. That's not the strongest fact that they have. It is all of it's going to come together. Cause you're right. This isn't just, she bought a Louis Vuitton purse without telling her husband, right? 30 grand in credit cards, forging his name, stealing cash out of his bank account. There's a lot there. There's a lot there. Alicia, your nickname is now Mr. Making Shoelaces guy. Yeah, that was such a horrible, I couldn't come up with a better example than that. Come on, making shoelaces. That was terrible. Tom, Peter, I can't speak for all, but this case will be a huge watch, my Lord. It is, I mean, it just is like, ugh. I hate to see this stuff. I hate to see this stuff. But let's get some official details on it, okay? So here is her um, warrant for her arrest. That's got the details of what she's charged with and some facts. The undersigned prosecutor states the information and belief on information belief, the defendant either directly or as a party committed the crimes of criminal homicide, aggravated murder. Okay. And we're going to get to why it's aggravated in a second. When we pull up the statute, we're going to pull up this statute 76, five, two, Oh, two, two that on or about March 3rd in summit County state of Utah, the defendant a did intentionally or knowingly cause the death of another individual under any of the following circumstances. XXVI. This is, why it's uh, aggravated murder. The actor committed the homicide by means of the administration of a poison or of any lethal substance or of any substance administered in a lethal amount, dosage, or quantity. Furthermore, the defendant was a cohabitant with the victim. So let's take a second and pull up that statute here. Okay? So this is the aggravated murder statute and it was 2 a xvi i believe yes the actor committed the homicide by means of administration of a poison or any lethal substance or of any substance administered lethal amount dosage so we're getting into how he was killed and how they caught her but i thought it was interesting as well where is this one that it could have even been under this section vii or seven uh, the actor committed the homicide for pecuniary gain. So there's a lot of evidence that money was the motive. I can almost guarantee money was the motive. And that was another enhancement for this to be aggravated murder. All right, let's get back to the affidavit. All right, possession of a controlled substance with the intent to distribute. On or about January 20, January 2022 in Summit County, State of Utah, the defendant did knowingly and intentionally possess with intent to distribute a controlled or counterfeit substance that was classified in Schedule 1 or 2, a controlled substance analog, or whatever acid as listed in Schedule 3. So where does this come from? Well, 
when we scroll down and there are, you know, one, two, three counts. So four total, I think I may have said five, five, four total charges. Three of them are basically possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute, which it's interesting. Was she actually trying to distribute them or was she using them or whatever in connection with the uh, murder count? But let's read some of the facts as to why she was possessing controlled substances and how they connect to the murders here. So here is the statement of probable cause. So here are the facts law enforcement is putting out about this case. And to wrap, we're going to listen to one more video, kind of recap of it. On March 4th, 2022, at 3.22 a.m., Summit County Sheriff's deputies and EMS staff responded to a residence located at 282 Willow Court in Summit County on the report of an unresponsive male. When they arrived, they found Eric Richens on the floor at the foot of his bed. Life-saving measures were attempted, but Eric was deceased, was declared deceased. During interviews with the deceased's wife, the defendant, Corey Richens, stated, okay? So again, she's talking to law enforcement. And as you know, we've talked about before, very rarely does this work out for you, especially when you lie right? So there's two ways this can really screw you up. You can make admissions or you can lie. So whether you did it or not, talking to the police is never a good idea. Because even if you misstate or make a mistake, it can be used as a lie in the future. So she stated that around 2,100 hours, which is what, 9 p.m. on March 3rd, so the night before, she and Eric were celebrating the defendant's closing on a house for her business. So that's the house in question that apparently Eric didn't want, yet they were celebrating, okay? The only people in the house were the defendant, Eric, and their children. The defendant stated, sorry, I, I missed a huge part. Sorry, closing on their business. Defendant stated, we're right here. Sorry, I skipped the very important thing I want to talk about. Defendant stated that she made Eric a Moscow mule in the kitchen and brought it to their bedroom where Eric consumed it while sitting on the bed. So let's talk about that for a second. So what do we have here? We have an admission. She admits to law enforcement that she made Eric a Moscow mule. That's important because to steal the punchline, Later, they're going to find out she put poison in the Moscow mule. So if, in fact, the Moscow mule is how he was poisoned, she just admitted to making it and giving it to him and nobody else touched it because nobody else was in the house. So that's a huge admission. Now, what it also says to me, again, about the whole like house situation is, are they celebrating it or are they not? Is he mad? Are they closing tomorrow? Or are they not? Because if they're making Moscow mules at nine o'clock at night, you know, with three kids, that can be late. You know, in your, I'll just say as somebody in your mid thirties, nine o'clock at night, Moscow mules, that's basically, you know, party time while the kids are in bed. That's, that's late. That's like back in the day in college, I was like midnight when you get started, you know? So were they celebrating? I think based on this timeline, Kind of sounds like maybe he was in and was cool with the closing on the house. I don't know, but that's why those questions and the messiness of that being a motive, I think is not worth it because they have so much better evidence. Like she admits to making him the Moscow mule and he gets poisoned from the Moscow mule and she's the only one that touched it and gave it to him. Obviously he didn't poison himself. Well, probably he didn't poison himself, I should say. All right, only people in the house were them and the kids. Defendant stated she went to bed and shortly after she went to sleep with one of the children in the child's bedroom because that the child was having a night terror. So conveniently, she was not in the bedroom with Eric. She did not sleep in the bedroom with him. He consumed the Moscow mule then was alone for a number of hours from around, I guess, 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. She awoke around 3 a.m., came back to her in Eric's bedroom. She felt Eric and he was cold to the touch. That is when the defendant called 911. So another thing potentially that could not be great for her is like, does anybody, if your spouse is asleep and you walk in there and it's 3 a.m., are you like feeling their forehead? My wife would be like, seriously, you just woke me up at 3 a.m. for no reason. 
and I would do the same to her. Now, maybe it was a cuddle and she just felt like shock because his body was cold. But then she immediately calls 911. And again, she told law enforcement, she's making all sorts of statements to law enforcement, that when she left her room to go to her child's room, she left her phone plugged in next to her bed and did not take it to her child's room. So this would fall under the category of lies. Do not lie. Because if you lie to law enforcement and they can prove that you lied, people will start to ask the question like they asked in the Alec Murdoch case. So many of you said to me that one of the hardest things for you to get around or even start to think about whether or not this was proven beyond a reasonable doubt is because why lie? Why lie about going down to the kennels? Why lie about seeing them if you really left and this occurred while you were at mom's house? Why lie? So again, right here, why would she lie about her phone being plugged in? She could have taken her phone with her and texted while she was in the kid's bed and she still wouldn't have known what happened to Eric. All right, so she says she didn't take the phone. However, between when the defendant said she went to the child's room and when she called 911, the status on her phone, because um, in case anybody doesn't know, they can get that information, the status on her phone shows that it was locked and unlocked multiple times and there was also movement recorded on the phone. We know they can record steps. In addition, tolls on defendant's phone show messages were sent and received and that she deleted those messages. <clears throat> That's not great for her. Following an autopsy and pursuant to toxicology findings from the autopsy, it was determined that Eric died from an overdose of fentanyl. The medical examiner indicated that the level of fentanyl in Eric's system was approximately five times the lethal dosage. The OME stated that fentanyl in Eric's system was illicit fentanyl and not medical grade fentanyl. There's a difference. It is also the opinion of the OME after evaluating Eric's gastric fluid contents that the fentanyl in Eric's body was ingested orally. So again, all of this points to the Moscow mule based on the timing, based on how it was ingested and based on what was ingested. CL, so how do they know she did it? How do they know, um, or how do they, why do they believe Corey did it? CL was identified as an acquaintance of defendant. A police records check of CL revealed multiple counts of possession of controlled substance with intent to distribute. Possession of a controlled substance and possession of drug paraphernalia. Uh, the detectives interviewed CL. CL told detectives, so CL, the reason it's her initials is she's probably an informant now because she was going to get arrested yet again and it probably wasn't looking good for her and this is apparently Corey Richens' drug dealer. And she told detectives because she snitched and flipped. Shocker. Don't do business with drug dealers. Um, that sometimes between December, sometime between December 21 and February 22, the defendant contacted CL via text message. Don't do your drug deals over text message. And if CL could get the defendant some prescription pain medication for an investor who had a back injury, we don't need to get into how weird that is. Why are you getting drugs for investors for you? Um, but they're going to assume it was a lie. Within a few days, she procured hydrocodone pills from the dealer. Defendant told CL to leave the pills at the house. Defendant was flipping in midway. CL left the pills at the house and defendant left cash for the CL or for CL. It had been determined that this house was owned by the defendant in December and January. So they've connected where she left the drugs to a house that was owned by the defendant. About two weeks later, defendant contacted CL again and said that her investor wanted something stronger and asked for some Michael Jackson stuff. Just gets weirder, right? Some Michael Jackson stuff. That's what it's been dubbed. Defendant asked specifically for fentanyl. CL contacted a dealer in Ogden on February 11th and procured 15 to 30 fentanyl pills from that dealer. Defendant came to CL's home and delivered the pills and, defend, and CL received $900 for those pills. Three days later on February 14th, and again, we know this happened on March 3rd, Eric and the defendant had a Valentine's Day party. Sorry, so she gets the pills on February 11th. Then February 14th, there's a Valentine's Day party at their Camus home. Shortly after dinner, Eric became very ill and he believed he had been poisoned. Eric told a friend that he thought his wife was trying to poison him. This is probably going to come in as other bad acts. Because of the timing and the MO and the way that she did it, she got pills from her drug dealer. A few days later, Eric's feeling sick and he tells his friends he thinks she poisoned him. So that was mid to early to mid-February. 
Well, now let's go to late February, February 26th. Two weeks later, she paid $900 for more fentanyl pills. She left them outdoor at the fireplace or by the fire pit at the Midway house where there was cash waiting for her. And just a few days later, like last time on March 3rd slash 4th, Eric was found dead of a fentanyl overdose. That's not good for Corey Richens. They have the drug dealer, text messages, proof of where they delivered the drugs that were houses owned by her, paid by her. And just a few days later, not once, but twice, she tries to commit this crime in this way. And of course, the other crimes of possession of controlled substance with intent to distribute. She had drugs. The distrib distribution, we can talk about that another day, why they charge intent to distribute. Um, but not a good factual scenario for Corey Richards. A very strong case that she had a plan and she executed it with the motive of insurance policies, buying houses, taking money, avoiding a divorce and a prenup where she might not get as much money as she wanted. All right. Answer just a couple questions, and then we got to get to this video. Susan, why was her court case pushed out until June? I do not know. I have not seen that yet. Netwoman, did she try to get a Social Security for the kids too? I have not seen any allegation of that, but it would not surprise me. Sandra, it is insane how she promoted the book and then she never gales off her jacket, takes off her jacket in the interview. They found that weird. They found her demeanor weird too, I believe. Why wouldn't this be first degree murder? It is first degree murder. Murder. How are they going to get in what he told a friend without it being hearsay? So again, it doesn't have to be for the truth of the matter asserted. It has to be for the effect on the hearer that he believed he was being poisoned. And then they can have other people testify that he drank something or he drank something that she prepared if they saw that with their own eyes. But he believed he was being poisoned. It's for his effect, not that she actually did poison him. You got to jump through different hoops of hearsay and how you get into this. But there are arguments to be made for that to get in. I think it's going to come in to show her other bad acts and the way that she does it. And this is how other bad acts are supposed to connect, in my opinion. This isn't like she stole money from her friend and they're going to try to bring that as bad acts that she stole money from him. No. They're claiming she poisoned him and there's other bad acts that she's poisoned him in the past. That's how it's supposed to work. All right. So for more background and specifically, somebody that represents the victim's families is interviewed in this video. So that's why I thought it would be a good video for us to watch together as well. My husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. It completely took us all by shock. Corey Richens wrote a book about helping her children grieve after the loss of their father. Now she is charged with murdering him. I've covered a lot of crime stories over the years, many of them here at Law and & Crime, and it always makes me think about how important it is for all of us to stay safe. We're gonna just skip you her. Eric Rich of here. Utah. Here we go. Police say he died of an overdose of fentanyl and that his wife, Corey, poisoned him with a Moscow mule. She was arrested this week and charged with murdering Eric and possession of a controlled substance. Court documents claim Corey told police that she slept in one of her children's rooms the night Eric died without her cell phone and that she later found him dead. But the documents say her cell phone showed movement at that time and text messages from the time had been deleted. The documents also state that Corey Richens had asked a drug dealer for, quote, some of that Michael Jackson stuff. Michael Jackson died of an overdose of propofol, a drug used in surgery as anesthesia. Just recently, Corey Richens appeared on the local news in Utah to promote a book she wrote about grieving entitled, Are You With Me? She wrote that book for her three children. I'm new to all of this, so kind of doing all, you know research and reading books and things to try and understand, you know, not only how to grieve as 
a widow, as a, as a wife, but also, you know, with my kids, how to help them, how to help them understand what just happened. It's also been reported that Eric had written Corey out of his will and that he actually believed that she was trying to poison him. The couple had also been arguing over the purchase of a home for $2 million, according to KPCW-TV. Eric didn't want to buy the home, and Corey closed on it the day after Eric died. She later resold it. Joining me to discuss the murder of Eric Richens is Greg Squirtus. Uh, he is a spokesperson for Richens' family. Greg, thank you for coming on Sidebar with us. We appreciate it. I'm happy to be here, Angela. How is Eric's family doing right now? I think they're doing very well. I mean, he died in March of 2022, which is now over a year. Uh, certainly they knew at the time that uh, he didn't die from a drug overdose that he himself had uh, consumed. But they knew that it was suspicious and they knew that something untoward had occurred. They're just happy now that the uh, Summit County uh, law enforcement community and the prosecuting office has uh, filed charges. They believe that uh, they're on the right track. They have confidence in the system. It did take a really long time, right? That's something we haven't mentioned yet. It did take a really long time for her to get arrested and charged with this when it seems like there's a lot of evidence pointing to her. So I'm interested in what took so long. Did the autopsy take so long? Um, did they? Did it take a long time for them to get her phone records? Those are some questions. There's still some questions I have, right? Because I've only been looking at this for like a day and this is some of the stuff I found. So you guys feel free to send me stuff. Instagram and Twitter at Tragos Law is my handle right here. Um, so if you want to send me more stuff, that's how a lot of you said you want to on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter is how you've pushed this content in front of me, which is what we're talking about today. But there's a lot, a lot of questions I still have. And that is one of them. Why did it take so long? And they're just looking forward to some resolution in this case. There are a lot of details coming out about this case. You know, Corey Richens, uh, his wife had written a children's book about grieving um, it sounds a little bit shocking given the allegations in this case that she poisoned him. Yeah, there's just a lot of ironies in this case and, um, it's really problematic. I mean, you can't, you can't make this kind of stuff up and it took a long time. I mean, it was a, over a year between his murder and charges being filed and that's not uncommon. I mean, it, I think the medical examiner's report had to be closely scrutinized and witnesses had to be interviewed. And it just took a very long time. There's certainly a lot of ironies in this case with respect to her writing a book about grieving when it, it appears that she may have been involved in the homicide, that she may have committed it. And um, so I, I, the family's just torn because on the one hand, they wanted to believe in her. On the other hand, the, the truth as it's coming. And um, so I, I, the family's just torn because on the one hand, they wanted to believe in her. On the other hand, the, the truth as it's coming out is certainly problematic. There's been some reporting uh, and some documents that claim that, you know, she had tried to poison him previously. She had asked a, a drug dealer allegedly for some of that Michael Jackson stuff. Um, Michael Jackson, of course, died of a fatal overdose many years ago. Uh, also, this argument and a dispute over the fact that she wanted to purchase a home for $2 million and he did not want to purchase the home. What can you tell us about that? You know, there were some problems between the two of them. Uh, they were related to finances. He came into the marriage uh, as a successful businessman. And um, I think that she may have felt that uh, if something happened to their marriage and he left her or she divorced him, that she wouldn't get as much of his estate as she would if he passed away. I don't know what her motivation is. Uh, we do know that the, a, a drug dealer was interviewed by police and that drug dealer has confirmed that she sold the defendant drugs, uh, opioids on at least uh, two occasions prior to the time that Eric died and that the sort of the dosage that she was buying each time was getting apparently stronger and stronger. And, uh, you know, I'm assuming he did not use illicit drugs. Eric never used drugs. He was a healthy man. He I mean, that's a good question by her. Some people may say, say it's insensitive, but I think that's a good question because if he was using that kind of drug to get high, I mean, that would obviously make a difference. And 
as in Murdoch situation, sometimes family members don't know. So maybe the spokesperson doesn't want, no, that is going to be a question potentially if Corey Richards does fight this case, or maybe they did the drugs together. Who the heck knows? So I think it's a fair question, even though some people are going to say it's insensitive. He had no family history of substance abuse. He had no personal history of substance abuse, had no criminal history of abusing drugs, medical history, anything like that. There's no evidence. Pretty good explanation that he didn't have a drug problem, but just saying fair question. He ever used illegal drugs at all in his lifetime. And he was really a healthy man. I mean, he was, he was avid in this kid's athletic activities. He was an outdoorsman involved in the search and rescue in the Summit County where he worked. He, he was a man who took very, very good care of himself and would not have uh, abused his body with uh, illegal opioids. How are the children doing? I mean, there were three children uh, that he had with Corey Richens. Um, where are they and how are they doing? They had three boys. They're apparently doing very well. They're with a close family member and uh, the family, uh, the broader family feels like they're in very good hands and they're with the with very, very good, good people right now. You know, one of the things that's so shocking about this, and, and I want to state that Corey Richens, of course, is innocent until proven guilty. She'll be back in court later this month, but kudos for that. Eric Richens, according to the documents and, and things he suspected or felt like she may have been trying to kill him. Um, so that's some pretty damning evidence right there. The fact that he had these suspicions and then changed the beneficiary in his uh, will and life insurance and things like that. Yeah, there was some some notion that he foresaw this, that he actually talked to some family members and said, if something happens to me, you should check out my wife because she is he believed that she was trying to kill him. Uh, there were certainly some some things going on between the two of them as it related to their marital finances and uh, just a culmination of things that ultimately resulted in, uh, according to the county attorney's office, uh, her deciding that uh, he, he should be killed. Well, uh, we are certainly going to keep an eye on this case. It's uh, really disturbing, the allegations that are being made here. All right, and that's the end of the part of the interview that I wanted to watch. So, I mean, it that gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on, where the victim's family stands right now. So hopefully everybody got kind of a full picture we were able to walk through the probable cause affidavit. Anita's asking, will she be eligible for the death penalty or is it too soon to know that? Thanks, Peter, for your fantastic channel. I believe Utah is like Idaho, where after arraignment, the state has 60 days to notify the defense if they are going to seek the death penalty. Um, I don't think she's been arraigned yet, but I could be wrong on that. Again, I haven't seen any of the court dates or anything like that. This is all brand new. This case is pretty, pretty new, um, but incredibly wild. So just let me know what questions do you guys have? Are you interested in us following this as the hearings happen, as arraignment happens, as either the notice gets filed or it does not get filed? Um, the notice of seeking the intent to seek the death penalty. Um, I want to know if this is something you all want us to follow and discuss together on this channel. So don't be shy. Let me know in the comments. If this just one is not for you, let me know. And if enough people from the channel want to watch it, then majority rules here, you know? Hit that like button if you haven't already. Please subscribe to our channel if you are interested in this case because you can have an effect on what case we follow, meaning this one. I appreciate you all so much. I'm looking forward to the members only live. I loved hanging out with you on a Friday afternoon, at least afternoon for me. I hope all of you have a wonderful weekend. Until next time, I'm out of here. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to The Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.